All right, so what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is the will of God and understanding the will of God. And uh, the title of my sermon is The Will of the Lord Be Done. This is actually a subject matter that I think a lot of people have difficulty with. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll include myself in that it's not always easy to understand maybe where the exact perfect will of the Lord for your life. And, you know, we all have decisions to make in our life. And, and hopefully you love God and you, and you want to do the things that he would have you to do. And, you know, we're doing a prayer challenge this month. And last week I preached a sermon on that. And we see in, in the example prayer that Jesus made, it's, you know, it's called the, um, the Lord's Prayer. Right? He says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That even in our prayers, when we're asking for things, we ought to be mindful about God's will. That whatever it is that we're asking for, whatever it is that we're looking to do, the decisions that we're looking to make, we ought to be trying to make sure it is in accordance with God's will. And that word will just means what he wants. You know, when you make a last will in Testament, it's your last will is what you want. You, you start writing down all the things you want to have happen after you're gone. That's what a will is. And um, it's important to understand, that, especially when you read the Bible, just knowing what the word will means. But I don't think that understanding what the will of the Lord is, is really meant to be difficult in God's perspective. I, I don't think that he views it as being very difficult. I think God is very black and white. We have a tendency to get confused about things because we don't have perfect knowledge. But the will of the Lord really shouldn't be very difficult. And ultimately, God's will, you could boil it down to this, that you would love him and keep his commandments. That's what God wants for you to do. And when you think about it in that perspective, there's not, there, there's not a lot of room for even gray area than that. Just if, you, if you love God and if you're living your life and just doing what he's telling you to do from Scripture, like from these words, you're going to be doing great. I can guarantee you this. You will be in the will of God if you love God and you're keeping his commandments. We know also God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? God wants people to be saved. So there's things about God's will we learn directly from Scripture, and it's very obvious, and it's written black and white. And, and like I said, that is something that you can just always, always, always rely on and just say, if I'm doing this, then I know I'm in God's will. But there's still some times where people, myself included, can get confused on some of the details. Usually, those details are in regards to where should I be doing God's will. Oftentimes, people contemplate moving, where I should live, or, or maybe where I should work, what type of job should I go, and, and where should I be going here, where should I be going here. That is where maybe a little bit of extra confusion can come in. But a very, very good friend of mine put it this way. It's, it says not the where of God's will, it's the what of God's will that we really ought to be concerned about. Because you can do God's will pretty much anywhere. The important thing, the most important thing is what of God's will, doing what God wants you to do. Now, that being said, that is the most important thing. I do still believe that the where does have some bearing and some level of importance. And we see that in this story here. We're going to see a few other examples where there is guidance and direction given through the Holy Spirit and through doors being open and doors being shut and God kind of lighting in the path and directing where he wants us to be. Now, first and foremost, the where matters nothing at all if you're not doing the what. If you're not, if you're not just, God wants me, you know, learning more about me. He wants me praying. He wants me soul winning. He wants me, you know, he wants me coming to church. He wants me, you know, living a certain He wants me getting sin out of my life. He wants me doing all these things. That is being in God's will. But the where part does come into play. And in Acts chapter 21, we're going to see here the Apostle Paul actually receiving the will of God through the word of God, through people preaching under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and giving him God's clear instructions. 
Now, the Apostle Paul doesn't listen to them, but we're going to reread part of this story here at the beginning of chapter 21. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patera. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unlade her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days. So get the story. There's the Apostle Paul and other disciples with him. They're traveling. They're evangelizing. They're doing the work of the Lord. They're preaching the gospel. They're getting churches started. They're going from, from country to country, from city to city, town. They're going all over the place, preaching the gospel, evangelizing, starting churches, doing all this stuff. And now they get to Tyre and they stop there. So it's a, it's a place where the ship has to stop. They're doing their business. They're unlading everything that's on the ship. So they go and find other brethren, other believers to go and lodge with, to stay with, to commune with. So they're there for a week. And it said, and when they're there, this is the message that they give to Paul. He says, who said to Paul through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So he meets with these disciples and they're saying, don't go to Jerusalem. And the Bible is informing us here that that wasn't just their opinion. That was the Holy Spirit speaking through them to the Apostle Paul saying, don't go to Jerusalem. So this is, this is very clearly, we could say, the will of God for Paul at this time was for him not to go to Jerusalem. God didn't want him there. And we can argue the reasoning, but I think this very chapter gives us a lot of the reasoning why he didn't want him to do it. God knows um, the beginning from the end. He knows everything that would happen. Paul ends up getting himself in trouble here and, and getting involved with, a, you know, shaving, keeping, there's a men that were keeping a vow and they wanted, they wanted to say, oh no, show everyone that you actually follow the law, Paul, and, and go in there and shave your head with them. And then they had to wait for the time they would give a sacrifice. Now, being in the New Testament, being after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and being after the time now that those sacrifices were supposed to be done away with. And the Apostle Paul knew this and taught this. And you could, I've proved this from other, at other times. I'm just mentioning it briefly that he ended up getting himself into trouble doing things he shouldn't have been doing at Jerusalem. And it caused a much bigger issue and problem in Paul's life by going there, getting arrested, going to Rome, you know, doing all those things. Now, God ends up working with him still, of course. He doesn't forsake him, and <clears throat> he's still able to make good out of a bad situation. And even though the Apostle Paul ends up not taking the advice of the Holy Spirit by doing something that he shouldn't have done and, and kind of refusing the counsel of God, you know, he, he wasn't, um, it definitely wasn't a malicious intent or anything like that. He was trying, he was still trying to serve God. He just wasn't hearing and wasn't receiving the message that he was getting to not go. He, he, he must not have considered it to be under the authority of the Holy Spirit when he was being told those things. Although clearly from scripture, it was. And he's being told not to go. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. The Bible says, And when he had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. So now there's going to be another warning given to the apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit. So this pro he's a known prophet. It says there's a certain prophet. He's a man of God. His name is Agabus. He comes down. He makes a trip down to where Paul is. Basically, they give him this message. Verse number 11, it says, And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet. So he, he ties them up. He puts them in like, like he's in bondage, right? 
And he said, thus saith the Holy Ghost. So now he's telling the Apostle Paul, this is what the Holy Ghost said. He's making a claim that this isn't me. <coughs> we didn't get that clear of information from verse 4. It just says that they, they told him through the Holy Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. We don't know the exact words that they used, that they said, thus saith the Lord, or thus saith the Holy Ghost. But here we have the exact phrase that's being used by Agabus. He said, thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. So Paul's getting an even stronger warning here saying, look, you're going to be arrested is what he's saying. You're going to be bound up. You're going to be locked up if you go to Jerusalem. That was a warning given by the Holy Spirit. And now everyone's saying, well, look, don't go. Why go and get arrested? Right? And that's, and that's a good point. You've got lots of places you could go and preach the gospel and do the work of the Lord. Why go over there and get arrested when the Holy Spirit's saying, don't go because you're going to get arrested? <coughs> but we see Paul's answer, verse number 13. It says, then Paul answered, what mean you to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So the Apostle Paul's intents are good. For all, all of his intentions are good. He's saying, you know what? I don't, I don't have a problem with that because you could throw me in jail. Yeah, you could put me to death for the cause of Jesus Christ, right? And, and yes, that's the spirit we should have. Amen. We shouldn't be worried about what man can do unto us. And obviously the Apostle Paul has been thrown into prison many times. He's been, you know, they've been tried to kill him multiple times. He's been all kinds of, been in, in various dangerous positions, all for the word of God and all for its sake. So he has the right heart, but he's not quite receiving the message. It, it's being told him, and it's kind of clear, don't go. But he's not getting it. And I think this would be one of those fuzzy areas where he's just, you know, there's, there's all these warnings, yet he still continues to go. Now, he's going with the right heart. He's doing the will of God in, in, in the sense that he's winning souls, he's reaching people and stuff. But in this area, he's not getting, he's not seeing the signs. He's not seeing, he's not hearing from God just saying that, no, don't go. And it says here in verse 14, and when he would not be persuaded, we ceased. So they were really trying to work on him and say, look, don't go. You're not interpreting this. Right. You know, like God doesn't want you going down there. This isn't what he has for you to do. Yes, you ought to have the attitude of, I could be arrested. I could be thrown in jail. I could be killed. And, it, and for the glory of God, I'll do all of that. But don't go and put yourself in that situation when you're receiving the warnings of God. And when he wouldn't be persuaded, they stopped. They, 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 they quit trying to persuade him. And they said, well, the will of the Lord be done. You say, well, let's let God's will be done. And that's what, they, you know, they couldn't say anything more, but that's, that's what they want to have happen. So, um, and obviously, you got to consider, it's got to be an interesting debate or persuasion with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a great man of God, right? And you got a lot of, all these disciples tell him, don't do it, don't go. Yet he forsook that and went anyways. And um, even with the warnings, he decided not to. Now, at the end of the day, Sometimes all you can do is say, well, the will of the Lord be done, like they did. Uh, you may disagree with someone, and this isn't a debate or a question of whether or not Paul should do something that's sinful, right? Like breaking God's commandments and doing this. Now, he didn't receive God's word, so I would say that he's sinning here because he was told not to go under the, the direction of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the same as like breaking one of God's laws, if you will, right? Like, like breaking one of the commandments where, where um, he's transgressing God's law. He's not, it's not determining, well, is this right or that right? This is something a, a, a little bit different level where he's still trying to serve the Lord and trying to do it right. But just um, like he's, it's, he's not like he's being a Jonah here, right? where God told Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh and Jonah didn't want to do it and he's just going and running the other way and just not want to have anything to do with it. The Apostle Paul's still trying to preach Jesus Christ. He's just trying to go to an area that he shouldn't be going to because God has other plans for him and where he wants him to go and didn't want him to go and get arrested down there. Now, uh, as I've kind of alluded to earlier, the key to knowing what the will of the Lord is ultimately comes from God's word. It comes from 
what God says. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word should lighten up our path and, and shine for us the direction that we need to go. And oftentimes where we end up is not known very early on, but we make the choices that we make based on God's word and we end up where God ultimately ends up wanting us. We don't see that in advance, the where of where we end up. But what we do is we, we make the immediate decisions based on the word of the Lord and we end up hopefully where God wants us. That's the point and that's why we go to God's word and we, everything that we do ought to be looking to scripture to help guide our decisions to make sure we end up going and being the places where he wants us to be. Now, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. We're going to show you just a couple of verses here on God opening and closing doors. And of course, these are like, these are doors of opportunity. Doors of, 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 to places where God will, will, will have someone to be or have something to do. And we ought to be looking for opportunities to serve the Lord. So, we have scripture, and this scripture is complete. We cannot be sitting around waiting to hear a new revelation from God, like a, like a prophet where holy men of God spake in time past as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and literally giving new scripture that's directly inspired from God. We have the completed word of God today, so we can't be waiting around to hear, well, God's going to talk to me and like give me a, a, you know, some like audible words or, or something to that effect where it's going to be, this is God's word. We're not going to receive any more from God. We have God's word. But what we also have in addition to God's word is the Holy Spirit that is meant to, to direct us and to guide us and to lead us, to prompt us in the right direction. And we need to be sensitive to that. We need to be aware of that and be thinking about what more can I be doing to serve the Lord? God, how can I serve the Lord? What, uh, what doors might be opened for me? And God might be opening doors for you and if you're not looking... You won't even realize there's a door there for you that God wants you to walk through. We need to be aware and just kind of focus and we keep these things at the forefront of our mind. How can we serve God? And, and what are opportunities are there available? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 12. Again, chapter 2, 2 Corinthians, you're in 1 Corinthians, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse number 12. You could stay right there because we're going to be there next. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 12, the Bible reads, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So this is the Apostle Paul, again, recounting what happened when he went to Troas. He's preaching the gospel, and he's saying, God opened up this door for me. There's a door opened up to me, and he said, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. It maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And what, what we're seeing here, he said, I was preaching the gospel and this, door, this opportunity presented itself. God opened up this door for me to do this great work somewhere else. And he says, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. So he, was, he, he wanted to find Titus before he left. He wanted to talk to him. And he says, I, I, I was troubled, right? It's something that bothered him and troubled him, having to depart and not being able to find Titus. But what does he do? He still takes the door, the door that God opened for him. He says, but... Taking my leave of them, I went from thence, so from there, from Troas, into Macedonia. He's saying, I, I, there was this call, I had to go. I really wanted to find Titus, my brother, I couldn't find him. I had to go anyways because God opened up this door for me and I just had to go and do it. And this is, this is something that we see here. You know, God opens up doors and he says, hey, there's this great opportunity here and he lays it on his heart and he knows, you know, however that the Lord was working 
and, and here in this, in this example with Macedonia, I think I actually have this in my notes. We're going to see that. Yeah, it's actually in Acts 16. He has a vision of going to preach the gospel in Macedonia. And this is something that, that's given to him of God to go and do that. But he's led by the Holy Spirit to do this. And even though he can't find Titus, he still makes the tough choice to just go. He says, I have to follow the will of the Lord and go and do this. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So that's where you are. Go to chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse number 5. Apostle Paul did a lot of great work for the Lord, which means that the Lord opened up a lot of doors for him to be able to do these great works. And Paul was in tune with the Spirit I mean, yes, we saw one bad example where he wasn't listening to, to what the Spirit was telling him, but there's so many other times where he was, and he was, he was perfectly in God's will, going where he want, God wanted him to go and doing the things that God wanted him to do and really getting a lot of things done. Look at verse number 5 here in 1 Corinthians 16. The Bible reads, Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Verse number nine. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now, God opens up these doors, but he says here, there's a great door. This is a great opportunity. I have got this awesome chance here to go and, and serve the Lord and preach the gospel, get a lot of people saved. It's a very effectual door that's opened up. There's going to be a great impact, a great effect. He says, and there are many adversaries. So the greater the door, the greater the opportunity, often what you're going to find is there's going to be more adversaries. There's going to be more reasons not to go and, you know, people preventing and trying to withstand the great work from being done. And an adversary, that's what Satan means. Satan is the great adversary. He's the one who's trying to stop God's work from being done. We need to be able to see opportunities when they present themselves opportunities to serve the lot to serve the lord greater to do more works for god and to really see a great harvest we need to be able to be open to that and then receive it when it comes our way um turn if you would to acts chapter 16 acts chapter 16 i'm going to read to you from john chapter 16 about what Jesus Christ, when he was talking about the Holy Ghost being you know, our comforter and our guide. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So here we see that from the Bible, the Bible teaches us that, that the Holy Spirit is going, to teach, is going to guide us into all truth. It's going to guide us into knowledge, into truth, into knowing what's right, what's true. God has given us that as a great gift to help lead us in this life and in this world and in, in what the things that we need to do. When you're born again, you receive the Spirit of God inside of you, which is a great gift, this comforter, the Holy Spirit, to help to guide us. Now, we're going to see some examples of the Spirit guiding the Apostle Paul and the disciples in Acts chapter 16. We're start reading in verse number six. The Bible says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So this is also very interesting when you just consider, what are they doing? They're going out and preaching the gospel, yet there's an area where the Holy Ghost is saying, don't go there. People say, you know, how does that match up? We know that the Bible's not willing that any should perish. God's not willing that any should perish, but they all should come to repentance. So why would they be forbidden to go to a certain area? Because that's not where God wanted them at that time. It's not that God wants all those people in Asia to go to hell, but God had another place in mind for them to go where they can do a greater work and get the job done. It's, it's like this. You know, you can think about it at a really, really small scale. If you have an area that's not very receptive, or if you even at a door, if you have somebody that they're willing to talk to you, but they are not willing to listen, 
and they want to argue and they want to debate, you can spend all day at that one door, right? And say, yeah, but his soul matters. Yes, his soul matters. But at the expense of every other soul, of every other person that actually might listen to you and receive the word instead of wasting your time and just beating your head against the wall, trying to convince that one person and spending all your time with them, we need to be wise with our time. We need to redeem the time because the days are evil and we need to be able to invest our time wisely. If you have an area, whether it be a city or a house, a door, and you cannot just spend all of your time spinning your wheels and getting nothing done, especially when there is plenty of other opportunity out there to get a lot more done. This is what we're going to see being taught here. And we even see it, the Holy Ghost forbidding them to say, don't go into Asia. Why? Because Asia is going to be a rough place. There's, there, I want you over here. This is where I want you to do the work, not over in Asia. And let's keep reading here. Verse number seven, he says, and after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So another place where the Spirit's saying, nope, don't go there either. That's not where I want you. I'm leading you to a specific area that I want you to be. Verse number eight, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. This is what I believe this was referenced in 2 Corinthians 2 that we already read when he said there was a, there was a door opened up unto him into Macedonia and, and, and he had to leave Titus because he had this vision. He's like, no, this is where we need to be. And they were I mean, preaching the gospel. You're in the will of God when you're preaching the gospel. Absolutely. But there are certain places where God's going to want you to be that's going to be even better. And that was the case with the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul wasn't a pastor. He was an evangelist, so he was going around and preaching the gospel. But he, he was still needed to be guided and directed, as we all need to be, you know, sensitive to what the Spirit is, where the Spirit's going to lead us and take us to do the work of the Lord. Because at the end of the day, even though we may have a lot of very strong ties and emotions and connections with people, we need to be able to ultimately do what God wants for us to do and what, where he leads. And sometimes it's difficult. In the Apostle Paul's case, it was as difficult as leaving Titus, which we know was a, a great friend of his and a brother in Christ. And the Apostle Paul was meeting a lot of people along the way doing the work that he was doing. He's getting churches started. He's building things. He's winning souls to Christ where he goes, yet he still, over time, is ending up leaving and going somewhere else. And he was in God's will. Now, that's not always God's will for everybody to pick up and leave and, and to go different areas. There's many places where I think God wants people to stay and stay put and be in there and, 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 and continue doing the work. And there's plenty of work for a lifetime to be done in certain areas. But other areas don't necessarily have the work of a lifetime to be done. Because it would be like spending your whole life with that one person that just doesn't want to hear the gospel. Now, we know that there's a spiritual battle going on. We always need to remind ourselves of this. We know that Satan is real. We need to be careful not to confuse. And this, this can be the difficult part of trying to determine and discern the will of God, especially when it comes to the where, is not confusing the spirit forbidding something, as we saw there. The spirit forbade them to go to a couple of areas, to Asia, right? It says not to go there versus Satan opposing you. Because they're two different things. We don't want to give in to Satan and let him win in his opposition to us to prevent us from doing a great work. But at the same time, we need to be sensitive to Holy Spirit being where God really wants us to be. And I think therein lies probably, I know from, from my, in my life, this has been the most difficult thing to really try to, to wrap my mind around and make sure that, you know, is this literally just Satan opposing me or is God through the Spirit trying to tell me something different? Let's look at some examples of Satan opposing. 
Okay, I've got plenty of examples here. You don't have to turn to all of them. Um, turn, if you would, to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. We're going to see probably the first example in 1 Chronicles 21 of, of Satan being referred to as opposing someone. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 21, 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, if you remember, God didn't want David to get um, a census. He didn't want them to count how big Israel had gotten to be. There are other times, like in the book of Numbers, where Moses had the people numbered, where God did want them to take a poll, if you will, and, and, and do a census and see, you know, where is everyone at. But by the time David became king, he said, nope, you just need to trust in me. Because the reason why generally you take a census, what you're doing is you're counting how many people are able to go to war. You're kind of gaining, a, getting a gauge of your, of your might, your military might, your strength, how many people can fight. That's typically what the, the, the poll would be for, the census would be for. God's saying, you know what, trust in me. You don't need to worry about how many people there are. Just trust in me. David is going through a lot of battles and stuff. And he just, I got you taken care of. You don't have to worry about it. But Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David. He prompted David to get scared and to number Israel and, and to, to do what God didn't want him to do, to go against the will of the Lord by numbering the children of Israel. So that's one example, or keep that in mind. He's provoking David to sin by doing something contrary to what God had said. Psalm 109, look at verse number five. The Bible says, and they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. So we've seen this in a lot of the Psalms. You know, David talking about people who are doing bad things to him and he's in a bad position and he's doing good, but they're hating on me. They're doing bad things to me. So now he says as a curse, verse number six, he says, set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. So a, a curse unto those that are, that are treating good people poorly, he's saying let Satan stand at his right hand. So standing at his right hand means he's his right hand man, right? Let Satan be the one to counsel him. Let Satan be the one to tell him things to do because Satan's all about destruction, right? And deceit and, and going after people. You think of Satan lying about Job. When Satan was withstanding Job, he was lying about him to God so that he loses everything. And his goal, though, was to get him to curse God, right? That was his goal. He was telling God, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's not, he's, he seems to be this great guy because you got him living so comfortably. But you go, you go after him, you take away his stuff, he'll curse you. And that's why he was lying about Job, and Job never did it. Satan was wrong about Job, and the way that he withstood him was by attacking him in, in so many different areas. But his goal, the purpose of Satan was to get him to cease, to get him to stop, to get him to, to blaspheme the name of the Lord. That was Satan's objective, just as Satan's objective against David was to get him to sin. Because David was in the will of God and, and was being blessed by God, Satan didn't like that. David's doing too much good. Let's withstand him and get him to sin, get him to cross God. Let's get Job to cross God. Set Satan, set, you know, the wicked people, let's set Satan stand at his right hand. I think that's very similar from Psalm 109 to 1 Corinthians 5, 5, where the Bible says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Right, this is someone doing wickedly in the church at Corinth that had his father's wife. And they're saying, you know what, deliver him to Satan. Or in 1 Timothy chapter 1, turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 10. In 1 Timothy 1.19, the Bible says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Why are they being delivered unto Satan? Because Satan's all about destruction. He's about destroying things that are good. He's about, you know, destroying people's lives. He was trying to, he destroyed Job's life, right? And here he's saying, well, you know what? We're going to deliver him to Satan. Now, the, the purpose in that case was, you know, to have a, a better outcome, to, you know, get them to learn. Or, to, or in 1 Corinthians 5 was, hey, maybe that he'll get saved through the destruction of his flesh. 
But these are all instances of Satan being involved somewhere. Satan being, you know, withstanding Satan doing bad things. Another reference to Satan standing at the right hand is found in Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So he's, Joshua is trying to do good and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. That is what the devil is trying to do. He's out for the destruction. You know, he also tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Remember that, those again, we're not gonna, I'm not going to read them for you for sake of time, but he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He was trying to get, what was he trying to do with Jesus? Trying to get him to sin. Oh, here's a stone. Why don't you make it into bread? Oh, hey, why don't you bow down and worship me and I'll give you all this stuff. He continually tries to get people into sin, into blatant sin, disregarding the commandment of the Lord. That is Satan's objective. As with Job and David, he's trying to provoke him to sin. This is what Satan is all about. He's about confusion, strife, sin, division among the brethren, and opposing great works. When an attack comes from Satan or a devil, we can see the way that he operates. The goal is to get you to sin, is to get you into sin, to doubt God, to, you know, to denounce God or whatever. That's his objective. His objective is not to cause you to do greater works and to do something even more for the Lord. His goal is not to get you to get more souls saved and to reach more people. Now, sometimes Satan may attack and God can use situations where Satan intends something for evil as Joseph's brethren did in, in Egypt, right? When, when Joseph's brethren cast him into the pit and they sold him into slavery. But God can mean, you know, turn that around and use it for good. So, you know, obviously we, we know that whole story with Joseph and, and, and Egypt and everything like that. Well, Satan may attack somebody and try to make things bad and God can turn around and make it even better. But we know Satan's goal is not to have more good come. So if we're trying to discern between the Holy Spirit forbidding you of something versus Satan just opposing you, what are the possible outcomes or decisions that you're making if you're deciding to break one of God's commandments or do something he doesn't want you to do, you're probably falling into Satan's trap. But if the result of, what's, of what you may be experiencing or seeing is to do even more work for God, then I have a tendency to think that that's probably the Spirit shutting doors for you and opening up other doors to do a great work and effectual. Understanding Satan's intent and God's intent will help you to discern your situation. When you know what God, because Satan's always trying to get people into sin. And Satan has been, I believe there's been devils attacking our church for a long time and trying to get people out of serving God, out of doing work, out of, you know, I think it's been happening for a long time and you see the, the result of it. Unfortunately, that's, that's the way things go. Not, not everyone is strong enough to withstand. But um, you know, the Bible teaches us to, to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We can take confidence in God's word knowing that no matter what, if Satan is attacking you, you could resist and he will flee. He'll, he'll go off and then try to find someone else. He'll pick another fight with someone, anyone you could get to get out of the fight because that's ultimately what he wants. He wanted Job out of the fight. He wanted David out of the fight. He wants everybody, anyone who's going to do any great work, he wants them out of the fight, out of the battle. Now here, I've been resisting for four and a half years and I'm not going to quit resisting. But upon a lot of consideration, I don't know that everything is necessarily Satan's doing. I think there's doors being opened and doors being closed because I'm not budging. I'm not, I'm not, I have, it's never been, never once been a consideration of, oh, I'm going to quit. And the devil knows that. I'm not even close to buckling under any pressure at all. 
I've experienced a lot of pressure lately. I'm not quitting. <laughs> I'm not going to, if, if anything, I'm just going to do more. And that is my goal. And that is my intent is to do even more. The pressure is not going to get me to stop work, serving the Lord at all. I had you turn to Matthew 10, though, because I, I want to give you a few other references of things that, that kind of helped impact my decision making and the things that I've been thinking about when really considering and praying and being very thoughtful and considering everything and having sorrow, as Paul did with Titus, and, and, and all of these various things going on. I think there are doors opening right now for me, but I, I want you to see some of these references that, that did play a role. I had you turn to Matthew 10. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon in it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So the teaching here is that, now there, there's two things being taught, because you notice in verse 14, he says, when you depart of that house or city. So in, in the first part, he's talking about entering into a town and then finding a house, right? Because what they're doing is they're going and preaching the gospel. He sent his disciples out to preach the gospel. So he's saying, when you go into a town, find someone who's worthy, basically, Find a brother or at least someone who's going to be saved and they're going to be hospitable. And they're going to take you in their house, you know, and you're going to stay there. And then when you stay with them, you, know, you could do your work in that town and stay in that house. But if you come into a house, and that's where he says, if, you, if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. So yeah, we're at peace. We're, you know, we're good. You could stay there. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. So you say, okay, well, I'm not going to stay here then. And then he's basically saying is that if they don't receive you, whether it's a house or a city, if it's a house and they don't receive you, shake off the dust of your feet, move on, right? Someone's not receiving you, move on. And there are cities that can be the same way. Now, when he's talking about cities that are not receiving you, I don't think he's talking about necessarily an entire city where every single person in that one city, every single last one of them ref refuses them. I don't think he's talking about it has to be, you know, 100% of every single person refusing you. Yeah. <laughs> even, even there, you're going to find some people that are saved and some people that, that will get saved. I think there's an overall, though, spirit of a town or a city and, and that's just like, yeah, by and large, you're rejected. I mean, the Bible says that, that Jesus, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Did every single Jew refuse Jesus or reject him? No, of course not. We know we got people saved. We know we got Jews saved. But by and large, as a whole, as a group, did his own reject him? Absolutely. Otherwise, that verse couldn't be true. He came unto his own and his own received him not. So while there are still a remnant, while there are still a small number of people, he's saying, hey, if they're just not receiving you, shake off the dust of your feet. This is a teaching from Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 13, Turn if, if you would, to Acts chapter 13. We see multiple times where the Apostle Paul kind of deals with it. The Apostle Paul had a heart to reach Jews because physically there is brethren. There is descendants. That's who he wanted to reach. He had a heart for them particularly. But see, God wanted him to go and reach the Gentiles. But he still continued to go back because he, he just, he felt the need to, to preach to him. He, he really loved him. He cared about him. He wanted him to get saved. But multiple times, we'll see here one example in Acts chapter 13. He, finally, he, he, he continually just throws up his hand being like, I'm done with you. I'm going to the Gentiles. I've had it. You just don't want to listen. Acts 13 verse 44. The Bible says, in the next Sabbath day, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but 
seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Saying, fine, we're done. And then you, if you want to, you can turn to Acts chapter 18. It's another reference here. Acts chapter 18, verse number four. The Bible says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. So I've had it with you. My hands are clean. I've preached the gospel to you over and over and over again, and you're refusing. I'm done. I'm moving on. It's a scriptural attitude to be able to, to have and to take given these situations. Um, I'm going to read for you from Matthew 13. Jesus traveled around and preached the gospel, of course. Matthew 13, verse 57. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 3. It's the last place I'll have you turn. We're done. I'm going to wrap it up. Matthew 13, verse 57 the Bible says, and they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Jesus went to his hometown and they're like, oh, aren't you the carpenter's son? Oh, you know, we know you. We know your sisters and your brother. You know, like, who do you think you are? And they don't want to listen to him. But what he's saying, he didn't, he didn't end up doing very much there. He didn't do great works. He didn't do many mighty works there as he's done in many other places. Why? Because of their unbelief. And he moved on. This is his hometown. This is where he grew up. He, I'm sure Jesus Christ, if anyone had a burden for the people that lived in his hometown where he came from for them to get saved, but you know what he did? He moved on. He moved on when they weren't receptive. He moved on when it was just say, well, I, I can't, I can't, you're, you're restraining me. I can't do very much. I can't do all of God's work when you just have unbelief. It was time for him to move on, and he did. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5. Proverbs chapter 3. Right after the book of Psalms, you have the book of Proverbs. It's right after the book of Psalms. You have the book of Proverbs, chapter number three, verse number five. Because ultimately, this is what it all boils down to when we're trying to make sure we're, we're in the will of God. We're not being confused, hopefully, by Satan's attack or opposition. We're being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit's guiding and teaching and that no matter where we are, we're doing what God tells us to do. We're not doing what God tells us not to do. And in Proverbs 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. That's probably one of the hardest things to do, is to just completely trust in God and His words, and, and not in your own understanding of things and the way that you see things necessarily, but that it's the way that God sees things and, and trust in God's understanding and in God's wisdom and in God's word. Trust the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Verse number six, and in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. If we maintain our focus on serving the Lord and what more can I do to serve God, and, and, and everything else, and we maintain that, then God will direct our path. He'll end up leading us where we need to be when we maintain that focus. And in everything that we do, we're acknowledging the Lord. Everything. In all of our ways. Acknowledge. This is what, you know, because what Satan's trying to get you to do is to not acknowledge the Lord. What Satan's trying to get you to do is get out of the fight. What Satan's trying to get you to do is get you to sin. That's what he's trying to do. We may feel some heat in that regard. But if you're just acknowledging the Lord in all of your ways and you're steadfast and unmovable, he'll flee. You resist 
he'll run away. And when he sees that that's not an option, he'll go attack somebody else. When he sees you're strong. I'm not perfect, but I know I've been strong against, against the attacks. I haven't wavered one bit. Not for a second. And I am constantly trying to make sure that I'm in the will of the Lord. I hope you have a little bit better understanding of where I'm coming from in my decision making. And if you disagree with me, I appreciate any feedback that you could give me when service is over. I'm more than happy to discuss it with you. I'm not perfect. I don't know everything. But I feel like I see things pretty clearly. And I think there's a great door and effectual opened up for me right now. And, and I think there's going to be a lot more work to be done. And there still remains a lot more work to be done here, for sure. But I hope, I hope this helps you to, to understand and understanding God's will in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for your instruction, dear God. We pray for clarity in our, in our life and in our minds and that you would help us to understand more perfectly um, what your will is and, and um, give us the knowledge, help us to be sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to, to lead us into all truth. And Lord, um, I pray that you please help us all to be steadfast and solid in, in our service to you and, um, and that we wouldn't be moved or shaken and, and wouldn't let outside events shake us in our walk with you, dear Lord, in our own individual walk with you. God, I pray that you please strengthen us. I pray that you please strengthen this church, help this church to grow and, and to reach more people and to continue to be a lighthouse in this area that, that definitely still needs the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.